Hurts. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like a lot of people here in the room are in a similar boat. You either have something, whether that's something that's old, whether that's something you're not really sure if it exists, whether it's in pieces, or you have nothing. I don't think I had a single person here who said, yes, we have a like super perfect, updated, amazing disaster plan. So there's always work to be done in disaster planning. Here's our agenda for the day. Um, I'm also realizing I did not say what NEDCC is, so I will also introduce the organization, because um, my guess is a lot of people in the room are not familiar with our organization. Is anyone here familiar with NEDCC? Oh, okay, this, is, this has been good. I've not talked to anyone else today who is familiar, so it's been exciting that you're all here to see me today. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know, NEDCC is the Northeast Document Conservation Center. We're based in Andover, Massachusetts, so just like 30 minutes north of Boston. Um, I work out of the center full time. I live in Southern New Hampshire. I'm actually originally a Vermonter though, so I will say it is extremely um, pleasurable to be here today and be back in the state to talk to you all. So Vermont organizations are very near and dear to my heart. Um, but the, the Document Center is a conservation center, so we have labs and we do paper conservation, book conservation, audio preservation, and we have imaging services. Um, but I am a member of the Preservation Services Department, so I am not a conservator. Please do not ask me about fixing your books. Um, instead, I actually get to spend most of my time leaving the center and going out to organizations all across the country. We work throughout the entire nation. And I do preservation assessments, I do workshops, I teach webinars all around preservation topics. So I do spend more of my time coming out and doing things like this. Um, and we are there to provide all sorts of free preservation advice as well as all sorts of other services as well. So we are a very useful resource for you to know about. So I'm excited just to have you all here today to just know that we exist and we're here to help you. But let's kind of get to our main focus, which here again is about disaster planning. And so our goal today is we're gonna talk about the emergency management cycle. We are going to talk about what it looks like to do a risk assessment and then talk more specifically about what a good disaster plan looks like. And if you have one, what are the things you should be looking at to fix? We'll then go on to talk about how, okay, so you have a disaster plan. How can you make sure you're ready to use it? Because unfortunately, writing one is not enough. Um, and then some resources, I'll point you to a few things. And then we're gonna wrap up by looking more at our tool called D-Plan Arts Ready. Is there anyone here who is familiar with D-Plan or an old version of D-Plan that used to exist? Two, three people, woohoo, okay. Um, so we'll talk about what the new D plan looks like and a little, we'll take a kind of a deeper look into it for, for everybody. Um, and then we might have time for questions at the end. And if not, I will be around to answer questions later today anyways. Does that sound like a good plan with everybody? Okay. <laughs> I am gonna get my notes. I don't really think I need them, but they are nice to have. Okay, so we are here looking at this beautiful graphic. Um, there's like a million of these graphics of the emergency management cycle. And if you have ever been to a disaster or emergency management training before, you have seen some version of this. Um, but it is an extremely useful framework for thinking about how we are thinking about emergency planning and disaster planning. Um, there's these four stages, right? Mitigation slash prevention, we sort of group them together. Preparedness. I think of that as sort of the first half of the wheel, and then you have that bottom half, right? What happens afterwards, that's your response and your recovery. All four are equally important, and as you can imagine, they all feed into each other. So once you've you know, had a disaster, the things that happen in response and recovery feed back into how you think about mitigation and prevention and preparedness in the future, and so on and so forth. And it is, unfortunately, an endless cycle that you cannot escape from. And I think a lot of people here in this room are very familiar with that and are somewhere in this cycle. I think unfortunately a lot of you are in that part of the cycle. You, you maybe didn't get to enter at mitigation and preparedness. You probably were for, forced to enter in response and recovery because a disaster happened. You weren't quite as prepared as you wanted it to be. You've learned a lot of things and now you're gonna take those lessons and you're gonna feed them back into this, back into steps one and two, which are mitigation, prevention, and preparedness. And so those are the focus of today because disaster planning, really falls mostly in, in preparedness in two, but is informed by things we're gonna talk about with one as well. So that's where our focus is gonna be, but keep in mind that the reason we're talking about one and two, the reason we're doing disaster planning is so that our response and recovery can be as smooth, 
as good as possible. There is a level of unpredictability here, and I hope everyone was here this morning for that amazing keynote because I think that framework um, and then how we deal with that uncertainty is really key to how we move through this cycle. So we're gonna talk about risk. Has anyone here ever done a risk assessment for their organization? I'm seeing some nods, like raise your hand. Okay, a couple people. Um, I actually think risk assessments can be kind of fun if you like being worst case scenario thinkers. Um, I do that very naturally, so I do think of them as kind of a fun exercise. They can get also very overwhelming because you can say, well, how can I think of every single possible disaster that could ever happen to my organization? You get overwhelmed pretty quickly. You get pretty depressed pretty quickly because you said, oh my God, what if one of these things actually happened? Um, so it can be a really, really hard thing to do. Um, but thankfully, we have a bunch of tools that can help make this not so overwhelming. Uh, an idea, essentially. So here on screen, we're seeing some of the things that you need to think about. You need to think about what, are you, what, is, what risks are you trying to identify? Um, you're trying to think of hazards. You're trying to think of things like those natural disasters that are pretty obvious. That's kind of one end of it, the floods, the tree falling. Um, but you also need to be thinking about man-made things that can happen, the pipe breaks, random arson. Like, I mean, there's, there's this huge range of things that can happen. So you're trying to identify some of those hazards, um, figure out where they're most likely to happen at your organization. And every single organization is different. Um, you need to be thinking about who is going to have the best understanding of these risks. So I have skipped, I've skipped the why, but that's okay, we'll go back. So we'll talk about the who. So this is you in the room, right? This is you at your organization. You are the ones who know the most about your organizations. But you also wanna tap into other people at your organizations. Now maybe, unfortunately, it is just you. I, I'm then, that is unfortunate. You have to really shoulder a lot of that burden. But talk to your volunteers, talk to your facilities people, anybody who spends a lot of time in your collections, who's gonna be the one who's gonna notice the water stain on the carpet first? Who's gonna be the person who understands that your roof is 15 years old? You know, who, who are those people? You need to tap into those knowledge centers. You can't know everything. Um, you also, though, wanna talk to your emergency responders. Um, for so many reasons. I'm not just in risk, risk management. I will say, I'll probably say this later as well. Invite them into your locations. Have them come by. Um, making that connection and having those interactions really will help you again when you eventually need to call on them for help. Talk to your insurance company. I know some of you were in the room for the last session with the insurance and law people. They had I mean, even for me, we always say like just go to the insurance people. Hearing from the insurance people today, even for me, was so handy uh, because I then go out and talk to people about what the sort of questions and kind of policies they should be asking their insurance agents about. So definitely talk to your insurance company. And also you can already start the conversation with some of your recovery vendors. They can give you a sense of what sort of disasters they see in your area. They can give you a sense of, okay, if this was a really widespread power outage and flooding scenario, how their resources are sort of diverted. All of those things help you understand the risk and start mitigating some of those issues right from the get-go. So we're kind of backtracking, why are you doing risk analysis in the first place, right? Why? Because it sounds like, like wow, that's, that's a project. Um, first of all, because it's gonna increase your recovery and response, you're gonna be able to maximize the resources that you have. You're gonna be able to respond most effectively. Um, and you can do some of the hard critical thinking about, I mean, we say cost benefit analysis here, about how you're going to spend those resources, what kind of insurance it makes sense to have by doing this early and by kind of tackling some of those uh, mitigation strategies head on. Um, and I know it can be hard sometimes if you're trying to get buy-in from leadership about doing some of these processes, um, about kind of approaching risk, because I think there's some leadership out there and people out there who would rather put their head in the sand about risk, right? Um, but I think kind of approaching it from this very logical way of saying this will save us money in the long run um, and that these are things that we cannot ignore, hopefully. I mean, okay, not hopefully, but unfortunately, many of you have recently had disasters um, and hopefully you can kind of use those disasters as evidence that, okay, this stuff is going to happen and it is unfortunately going to continue to happen. Um, but if that's not convincing enough, I think some of these, these talks of cost benefit can sometimes be very um, convincing 
when you're talking about risk analysis with different levels of your organization. And that's why I also recommend, we have a number of tools, but the one I, my favorite personally um, is this first one. It's the Risk Evaluation and Planning Program, REP. That's what you're seeing here on the screen. It's this very um, kind of intense, I guess, looking spreadsheet. Uh, it is linked. I have a lovely resource guide that goes with this presentation, and it has so many resources and links. I worked very, it is long, and I worked very hard on it, so I, I really encourage everyone to like peruse it. This is one of the things on there, um, along with like the slides, so don't worry about like your note taking and everything. Um, but what's nice about this is it's a spreadsheet you can go in and edit, and it has an enormous list, this is just part of it, of hazards for everything you can imagine. And it, like things you wouldn't have thought to imagine on your hazards list. Um, and for each item, you're gonna put the likelihood of occurrence on a scale of one to five, and then you're gonna put like the severity of the damage it would cause in your organization on a scale of one to five. And it's gonna do some math for you, and it's gonna come up with your risk rating. And if that risk rating is above like a three or a four, it will automatically make that box turn like a red angry color. And then if it's like a one or a zero, it'll be green, it'll be nice, and then there's like a yellow in between color. So it's a really visual way and it's a really quantitative way to demonstrate what the risks are to your organization. And then you can again hand that to other people like your executive director, like your board of trustees and say, okay, these are the risks we have and this is why I would like X amount of money to do these mitigation strategies. Um, and then there's like a little comment section so you can write like, yeah, this actually happened in 2023 and this all flooded and we spent this amount of money. You can put whatever you want in the comment section. Um, I mean, again, so the reason I like it, it's comprehensive, right? It's gonna make you think of things that you hadn't thought of as risks before in really kind of granular ways. It's also gonna make you like kind of grateful. You're gonna realize, wow, I don't even have to worry about volcanoes here in Vermont. You know, you're gonna be able to cross so many things off the list that you don't have to worry about. Um, and you'll just find more that you didn't worry about before. So it's, it's a win and a lose. Um, but that is a really nice starting space. Again, if you've never done a risk assessment before, that one's pretty easy. Um, it's, you know, one and just pick a number, you know, and it's not perfect science. You might have multiple people at your organization do it because it's a little subjective, right? Um, there's another tool here. This is the library collections risk assessment tool. This one's um, more dedicated to like libraries specifically and about like doing cost benefit analysis of if you lost this amount of your collection, what it would cost to replace. Only use it if you're like a, a library with a physical collection that would have to be replaced. Um, but if anybody in that room is that, there you go. Um, and then we have the probability and impact matrix, which is what this looks like. Um, kind of looks weird, but okay, doesn't matter. It's this beautiful rectangular matrix. You could draw it on a piece of paper right now. I think I do have a blank one PDF like linked in the resource guide. But what's nice about this is you could sketch this on the back of a napkin, you could do this while you're having, you know, morning coffee at your organization. Um, this is a pretty casual, pretty low lift, a little more subjective. Um, and it is just, as you can see, balancing high probability, high effect versus low probability, low effect. Um, really, really basic on here. You can see this one's from a couple of years ago. This was like an example when we filled out. Pandemic flu is over there under low probability, high effect. We might rate it differently now. This was pre-COVID, um, but I think it was post like the H1N1 like swine flu situation. So it was like something that was on people's mind, but um, had not, you know, COVID definitely changes how we understand, I think some of this matrix in terms of that, that particular risk. Um, but this looks different for every organization and it looks different at different times. Um, so I think all of you are really well aware of the risks of floods, for example. So you're definitely putting flood in high probability, high effect. Um, maybe you don't have shelves at your organization, so shelf c collapse doesn't even end up on the list. Um, so this is just a, a good way to just start kind of the initial mapping because these items here in this corner are the ones you're gonna wanna start preparing for first. They're things that you're gonna wanna pay special attention to as you do your disaster plan. You might not worry about that far corner as much. Um, and again, this is not meant to be exhaustive. You cannot plan for absolutely every disaster. It's, it's just physically impossible. So what you wanna spend your time doing when you're doing a risk assessment is figure out and identify what are the most likely risks that are going to do the most damage. 
that's where you want to initially spend as much time and energy as possible there that for a good reason. Um, and then if you really feel like you got a hold on all of those, you can move down to things that are maybe high probability but low, low effect, something like a, a leaky toilet. Um, you know, go, go from there, but definitely don't think that your risk assessment has to be something that covers everything immediately. Uh, what, I, what I will say is unfortunately it's also not one of those things that you can do once and then cross off the list. A risk assessment, especially if anyone here has done one, um, if you haven't done it in the last like, well, first of all, if you haven't done it since COVID, it's time to do another one. Um, if you haven't done it within the last like two or since your last disaster, do another risk assessment. Um, you might just want to say, we're going to do one every year. Um, it's, it takes a little bit of time, but for how it helps you understand the th problems you should be anticipating is really, really invaluable. Also important to do ahead of any construction, any major changes to your building. I think there's a lot of people who like during times of construction, you're organizing, like that's when a lot of fires happen. Um, and so you want to be anticipating some of those extra risks ahead of any sort of projects like that. And there is a risk assessment tool built into D-Plan Arts Ready, and so we will also be looking at that later today. Oh no, I've lost the... Nope. Okay. It's not it either. Okay, here we go. Oh, I already covered this. When to reassess risk after a disaster during a construction project, facility change. Oh, exhibit planning, that's another good time. You're gonna have more people in your building. You might have more objects at risk. Um, so definitely if you are a new organization that does any sort of exhibits, um, if you're gonna have a big event, a big performance, if you're a performing arts organization, like all of those are moments where even just a small risk planning or risk assessment exercise might be really useful in terms of staying ahead of and understanding if anything is changing. And you might do a risk assessment and find out nothing's different. Great. Um, you might find out that there's another thing that you want to account for in your disaster plan. Staff turnover. Um, I think, unfortunately, some organizations, if we did a risk assessment every time we had a staff member leave, we would be doing it all the time. Um, so you think strategically when major staff leave, though, you want to make sure that, that you're changing, you know, maybe that person was the person who knew where all the fire extinguishers were. Well, your risk is different. You have a higher risk of having an issue with a fire if that person leaves. So that's, that's why you want to think about that. Okay, are there any questions about risk assessments? We're covering a lot of information, I know, kind of fast. So I'm happy to pause here. I am going to grab my water bottle. How do we access yes. the, uh, all the materials that you're referring to? It's going to be sent out in an email. Okay, to all participants? Yes. Okay. And how soon? Yeah, I was gonna say whenever whenever Rachel wants to send it out. I mean, I I owe Rachel a li you know I have I have to send it to them, but yes, yeah, yeah. Um, we're an organization that doesn't have a lot of physical assets. Can you talk a little bit? And, and we do risk planning for events. In your experience, are there other things? I'm trying to think of what I'm not thinking of in terms of risk assessments that are it's not for physical assets. That's a great question. I am mostly in the business of risk assessment for physical things and collections. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're bit, like, you do want to, and I mean, I, I do not focus on like human life, for example. Obviously, that is the number one concern and priority of disaster plans. Um, our disaster planning is focused on collections and things like that. But yes, yeah, so you would like to make sure your risk plan is for, if not your building and then what happens in the end event, then... I think that's mostly it. <laughs> yeah, that's and then, so when you're doing your risk assessments for events, you're assumably mostly thinking about human life, how you're evacuating everyone safely, that sort of thing. Yeah. So other other than that, if you don't have any, like what your else your risk assessment should include, I would not say I would be an expert to ask on that. Unfortunately. Good question though. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit about disaster planning, and, and again, we'll stop again for questions. Um, so we were, risk assessments really fall under that mitigation prevention phase, right? Because um, how do you know what you're gonna prevent and mitigate unless you assess what risks you have? Um, and so then we go on to preparedness. How are, now that we know what our risks are, how are we making sure we are prepared and planning accordingly? 
And so that's where your disaster plan comes in. A disaster plan can look like a lot of different things. Um, everyone's is gonna be sort of unique and special to their organization. But I would say in general, this is what it's trying to pull together. Essentially a disaster plan is just the spot, ideally physical, where you are collecting and collating all of your resources. So when I say resources, I mean kind of the obvious, like people, who are you gonna call, right? Your insurance phone numbers, st key staff members, first responders, conservators, you name it. What kind of services, and, and some of that, there's an overlap there, people versus services, but what are the organizations that are gonna do like mold remediation for you? You would wanna identify those ahead of time. Who has the you know, industrial dehumidifiers that you might need to rent? Identifying those sorts of services. Procedures, what do you need to do? Do you have a really important photograph collection? Well, you'd wanna identify you know, what are the main things you would do if, if your photograph collection got wet, how do you handle those? You can write that list out. You know you have a photograph collection, you know if it gets wet, it needs to be dealt with very quickly. This is the time to write out that procedure of, of what you do to a wet photograph collection, as an example. Places, where are, is your meeting spot for staff, but also where are you gonna do wet salvage if your building is inaccessible? Um, where is your command center gonna be for organizing volunteers and resources that you can have like internet and power if your building is unusable? Um, unfortunately, you also need to think about if your whole community is affected um, and none of the buildings nearby are accessible. Do you have a third option? Again, you might not be able to plan or come up with a great answer for all those scenarios, but that's the kind of line of thinking that you want to be doing. And then supplies. What are the sorts of things you're going to need? Um, we, you can't always keep like a full stock of every single disaster, and we'll talk more about disaster kits, but um, you might want to have on hand you know, some big tarps, newspaper, you know, there's all sorts of things that, even the most basics like gloves and things like that. Um, can, is that kind of the kind of thing you can have on hand? Or do you at least know that there's a business somewhere in town, out of town, that you'd be able to get them? Do you know where the nearest hardware store is? And the only reason I say that is because we're kind of growing into this place where people don't always live in the communities that their organizations are located in. And so I don't, I work in Andover, but I don't live in Andover, and I would have no idea where the nearest hardware store in Andover, Massachusetts is. Um, so you would want to know those things, or know you know of them in the area, or know that there's somebody down the road who would loan you their generator, for example. So these are the sorts of things that you can think about ahead of time and plan for ahead of time that might go in your disaster plan. So this is sort of breaking it up more, a little bit more specifically. Um, so A is your institutional information. Um, and this is a great tie-in, again, I really want to highly recommend if you can watch the recording of the last session that just went on, because they talked a lot about, and they had this wonderful handout of all sorts of business continuity information that you should have. And I think especially for collecting institutions, we worry so much about our collections that we forget there are key institutional, organizational business records that we have to have to continue to operate. So those are just as important as like, your book collections. Um, so what institutional organizational information, right, your, your deed for your building, your insurance information, things like that. Um, B is the services, we already talked about that. C are those emergency equipment and supplies. Um, we'll talk more about supply kits. Any additional services, I mean, that's mostly covered in B. Daily upkeep checklist and weekly, Upkeep checklists, um, these are sort of the idea, those are things that you can include in your disaster plan that are really mitigation techniques. One of the biggest things that you can be doing is doing walkthroughs of your organization. And I know we all get guilty of this. We go to a building every single day and we become blind to any changes. And you don't notice that there has been a, an increasingly growing stain that wasn't there before on that one floor. And the sooner you notice that, the sooner you can mitigate a problem before it starts. So it's this sort of practice of how can we walk through our organizations with new eyes? What are the things we want to keep an eye on? Because you might know that there's a weird corner over there where the wallpaper looks kind of funny and you're keeping an eye on it, but then what if you're out sick and you've told no other staff members? So what other staff members walk through your building every other day that can also be there to make sure that there's not mold growing or that there's not something happening? So making sure there's an awareness of all your staff and kind of making an official checklist as silly as it sounds can be a way to kind of create some accountability for that. Other emergency issues. 
Again, this disaster plan, the way I'm phrasing it, is collections-based, but this is also the place where your other emergency plans for human life and safety might go in. If you have you know, a procedure for like an active shooter event, th there's sections in there. You can make your disaster plan look however it needs to look, depending on the kind of audience you're serving and what kind of events you host and things like that. Um, drawing station location. We sort of already talked about that. Where are you going to bring your stuff? Um, can you go outside? Is there a space in your building that you'll use if only one floor is affected? Like, say, your whole basement's flooded, but you're like, I know the first floor research room's going to be clear. That's great. Or maybe you know the high school next door will you know, let you use their cafeteria. Um, and then this is a hard one, salvage priorities. Um, if you are a collecting organization, what do you say first? Um, for some of you, that might be easy. You're like, we only have like this one thing, and it's really important, and it's key to our mission, and we know we saved that thing. For other people, that might be harder to decide, um, and it might also be hard because you might think that every single item in your collection is equally important. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, if we treat every item as equally important, they will all be equally at risk in the event of a disaster. Um, and if we think really hard about it, we know that that newspaper collection that somebody donated really randomly one year that we didn't doesn't even match our mission, that's not as important as the you know 300-year-old Bible. Those are really random examples. Um, but, in, but you get my point. You have to sit down and work through these. And these might be hard emotional conversations that you have to have with staff, with I wouldn't necessarily always involve volunteers, depends on your organization, with board members perhaps, with leadership. Um, so that's why you have to have those really hard, really emotional conversations now, because it's really hard to do, have those conversations after an emergency. And again, some of you might have been in that situation where you've had a flood and stuff is wet, and now you're having the argument of, should we really put in a bunch of effort to save this newspaper collection? I have a, real, a bone to pick with newspaper collections. Anyways, um, and then salvage procedures. So again, I said that kind of had that photograph example, but know the kind of formats that are in your collection. So know if you have fine art versus, um, photographs versus newspapers versus cassette tapes, because they all get handled very differently in specifically water scenarios. A lot of the disasters we worry about are water because even in the event of a fire, it usually ends up being a water scenario. Um, so in that case, do your research ahead of time to have some basic thoughts about what needs to happen to those various formats in your collection. If you don't have photographs in your collection, great, you don't have to worry. That's one thing to cross off your list. Um, most people probably have paper, so having a sense of the kind of paper materials you have, how old they are, how fragile they are, what they will do in the event of being wet is really, really good to think about. Um, again, you don't have to, there's lots of resources out there to help with disaster planning. We're specifically linking to a worksheet that we have that helps with that. Um, and then there's a bunch of resources in the resource guide I made about how to think about those specific um, format types. So unfortunately, even if you do have a disaster plan or you have pieces and parts, um, even or if you sit down and you write one, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not enough because um, you have to update it. A disaster plan is only as good as the kind of accuracy of its information. And unfortunately, things keep changing. You move a collection from a different spot. You have a new exhibit come in. You have an item on loan. Your building's changing. You're hosting a big event. All of those are reasons why you might want to revisit your disaster plan. Um, we do really recommend like picking a day a year. And so our biggest recommendation is if you don't know what to do, um, SAA has May Day, which is May 1st, to make that your day where you somebody sits down and says, is everything in here still accurate? At the very least, you probably have to update your contact page. You probably have somebody who left or changed jobs or changed phone numbers or something. Um, so it should be easy, but you should be constantly making sure that is on your to-do list. Then you want to know where do you put the disaster plan. Um, we do really recommend having a physical copy um, and not just having that physical copy be the one copy that's kept at your organization. Because a lot of times, what if you're not there and your whole building is then inaccessible and all of that good planning is in a binder in your office and you can't get to your office. So you want to have a physical copy ideally on you. Maybe you keep it in your car. Maybe you keep it at your house. Maybe a couple key staff members have like that full physical copy. And then you also want to have it online so that in case, you know, you weren't able to get any of those physical copies but you have cell phone service or you have Wi-Fi, you can get online. 
But you have to remember that what if you can't get online or on your Wi-Fi, you want to have that physical copy. So you want to have both, ideally. Um, and you, you can think about you know, who needs that full. Not everybody needs the full disaster plan. Not everyone needs that list of your most important items ranked um, and where they're located, ideally, um, because that's a, that's a theft threat. Um, so you, you don't give that to your, vol your average volunteer. You, you're very strategic about who gets the full plan. Um, but somebody should have a full copy of the plan. And then strategic staff need you know, the copies that pertain to them, essentially. Um, and then I say, don't forget about your PRR. Do I include a picture? Yes. Does anyone here have a pocket response resource? Has anyone ever here seen this? Three people. OK. Um, I did this once, and somebody had one like in their pocket, and it was pretty exciting. So this is what I would encourage everyone here today, no matter what kind of organization you work at, essentially, to go home and fill out. Um, it's linked here. It'll be emailed to you as well. Um, it is one piece of paper that you can fold and put in your wallet or put in your purse or whatever you carry with you. Um, and it is really easy to fill out because it is this whole front page. It's true. It's a back and front. This whole first page is just contact information which actually is kind of exhausting sometimes to find, but you will, it's not that hard. So it's just, you know, who are your key contacts? You know, who's the executive director? What's their phone number? Who's in charge of financial services, PR? You might not have some of these. You can edit this template. You can say, okay, well, there's only three of us, so you just list all three names, that's fine. Um, who's in charge of responding to things? Again, this kind of depends on the size of your organization, but you know, if you have your facilities manager and you and your executive director as the three people who need to be called in you know, response to a disaster, that's where they go. Building context and also like your, who's your get electric person, who's, who are you calling the event of a clogged pipe, like all of those basic facilities vendors get listed here. First responders, other emergency services you might need. We can, we give some like prompts there, but you know, customize it as you need. Um, and then the other, I didn't include a picture of the back. The back has some very basic salvage advice um, and also a spot for you to write some of your like priority items. So that if you gave that to a volunteer, like your facilities person who maybe doesn't know your collection that well, but they are the first in the building and they know that they should grab that one box that has like the most precious books, great, it's listed there and they have, they have the information they need. And then, Supply kits, um, you can, these are like very fancy supply kits that you can go buy pre-made, which is nice, especially if you don't have a lot of time to devote to this. You say, okay, I'm just gonna go click checkout. Um, and they can range from like this little small five gallon bucket with some stuff in it to like this very beautiful, huge, big trash bucket, which would be really nice to have on hand. But you know, I understand that we don't all have room to store one of these big fancy buckets. Um, and so, you probably need something in between that with a kind of a key few things that fit your organization best. Um, so in the resource guide, there's lists to ideas and you can sort of go through and pick and choose. Like I definitely need gloves and tarps or, or depending on the kind of collections you have, what kind of wet salvage you might end up doing. Just think about those kits. Think, brainstorm what would be best in them. Hopefully you can convince somebody that that's a, a worthy investment for your organization. Um, maybe it's something that you agree to share with nearby organizations. I don't think every single, you know, if you have a community with a library and a historical society and a museum, does everyone need to have the same kits duplicating? I mean, maybe because maybe everyone has a flood at the same time. It happens. Um, but maybe you guys can share and you can say, okay, we need to bring it over to this building because they just had a pipe break. Um, there's ways to kind of do this in a way that doesn't put all the pressure on you as an individual organization. Um, yeah, that's my, I feel like there was something else I was going to say about disaster kits. And so these are the other things that you, oh, I remember what it was now. Um, check them when you update your plan because what happens is you say, oh, there's good, really good scissors in the disaster kit and I actually need those today for a project. And so you go and take the scissors out of the kit and you never put them back. And then you have a kit on the day of a disaster with nothing useful in it. Um, it has happened quite a bit. So. Check, check the supplies in there, make sure they're still good. Um, the other things you wanna be doing, touching base with your vendors, spending time with your fire department. At most organizations, they have to come in pretty regularly anyways to do certain checks of fire suppression systems. Um, you maybe take some time to tell them about what your organization is if they don't already know. Um, make sure that phone tree is being updated. I sort of maybe said that three times already today. It's that important though. 
Um, and just stay in contact with any other local response organizations. And again, I wanna highlight how great it is that everyone is here today attending today because these are the sorts of groups that you're going to call on in times of emergency. You, being in, in touch with your community um, is extremely, extremely useful. Okay, so say you do all those things. You get, you've managed to get a disaster plan written, you're feeling pretty good about it, you have a disaster kit, you sort of checked all those boxes, you have all your resources, your vendors, your contacts, everything's lined up and you're tired at this point, but you're feeling really good. Unfortunately, it's not over, <laughs> there's more to do. Um, and that is training, because the disaster plan is only as good as your ability to implement it, which is what I said earlier today. So you want to practice things. I think a lot of organizations maybe already have practice fire drills, but if you don't, it's a great thing to practice. Um, test your systems. You can do, I don't, I don't know how much I actually love this idea of pop quizzes at staff meetings, that, that seems kind of mean to me. Um, but if you are worried that your staff are not reading and absorbing the information in their disaster plan, you can give them a pop quiz. Say, hey, does everyone know where we go in the event of X? Does everyone know what, where the water shutoff valve or where to find that information? My favorite personally is a tabletop exercise. Um, this is, kind of, that's kind of an emergency management term, but it is essentially just a practice scenario. Um, I have linked to a great selection from the Library of Congress um, who give you all sorts of fun, horrific things that could happen. Um, and you sit down and say, okay, if, or you, or perhaps you have one that has happened to you in the past that you wanna try again. Um, but any, any sort of things like that, you sit down, you, you kind of make this part of a larger team building exercise in my opinion, um, and you walk through and the Library of Congress gives you all sorts of question prompts to answer so you can understand in the event of this specific scenario how you would apply, apply your disaster plan. Uh, the conversations that it can come out of that, the stress tests that it can put your disaster plan through is absolutely invaluable. I have, we a lot of times in our longer workshops will kind of walk groups through that and it leads to a lot of progress on, on making sure your disaster plan is really what it needs to be because it gets really easy to kind of forget obvious things that are maybe clear to you but not to other people at your organizations. That kind of goes hand in hand. Review the plan as a team. Make sure your staff have buy-in. You know, somebody mentioned they're not sure if their organization has a disaster plan. Well, it's as good as you not having it, right? Because you don't know it exists, so somebody didn't do their job in making sure you are aware of it. Fire extinguisher training is really fun, so if you can convince somebody to let you host that, I really recommend it. You get to play around with the fire extinguishers. It's a great time. Um, Hands-on salvage training. This is something our organization offers. Um, but lots of organizations do it, and so keep an eye out to see if it comes to your area because having that hands-on tactile experience with handling wet books and wet materials, if you have not done that before, um, really helps with that response and recovery. And then there's also online courses. So we teach other disaster management courses, lots of organizations do, so it's always something to keep you fresh. Even if you feel like you know a lot about disaster planning, I don't think the refresher ever hurts. Okay, um, I'm just gonna go through these selected resources and then I'll pause for questions. Uh, okay, salvage at a glance is a huge, beautiful chart that will let you know how to salvage various types of formats. So it will say like printed books, it will say CDs, you, list, you name the format, this chart goes over it. Um, I recommend putting it in your disaster plan, like print the entire thing, highlight the formats you have, put it in your plan. I worked with one organization that actually like laminated it. It was beautiful. That's kind of a nice idea because you're going to use it in a, usually a situation where there's some water involved. Um, there's, I feel like people may have seen that wheel before. That's kind of nice. It's giving you some basic re emergency response things and it's nice to like have a physical thing. But they also just came out with a beautiful app. So download the app the FAIC app on your phone. And it has all the stuff in the wheel, but it's basic emergency response things for collections. Um, and it doesn't require Wi-Fi to use. So as long as you have your phone on you, it can be really handy. And then this is like an example of some of the leaflets that are free on our website. Don't worry about what they are here. They're all linked in the resource guide. And then who are you gonna call in the event of an emergency? Not. Yeah, <laughs> probably not the Ghostbusters, but yes, as Rachel just said, back darn, there's the phone number. Um, but you can also call me. Um, like really specifically, sometimes this hotline just goes to me. Um, sometimes it's my colleagues, but a lot of, you know, every couple months it's me. 
Um, and we will answer that phone anytime we're awake, I will say. I try to like think that it will wake me up when I sleep. It never has. Leave a message and I'll call you right back. Um, but like also nobody's ever called us in the middle of the night, essentially. So call us during the day and we will immediately answer, no matter the time of day. We get people in California that call us at dinner time and I answer the phone and we talk about what to do with their photographs. Um, so call us, we're happy to help. If you have stuff that's not paper document based, so if you have a furniture collection, if you have stuff, I recommend calling, if not Vactarn, you know, maybe it's 6 a.m., you can call NHR, um, National Heritage Responders. They will deal more with like three-dimensional stuff. We just do not, I will say, if you call us, we will talk to you still and we will help you work through the idea. We just don't have that much specific advice about furniture or like 3D objects or textiles and things like that. I recommend saving these numbers in your phone so that you're not looking them up. These are, con I have it, I mean, I work at NEDCC and I have the 24 seven hotline number saved in my phone, you never know. Um, I have the NHR number saved in my phone. So put those in your phone now, along with any other key contacts. Like, these are experienced recovery vendors. I do wanna highlight though, Polygon. Rachel had kind of mentioned earlier and I had already flagged that Polygon has a contingency contract with the state of Vermont. So not that the state of Vermont is gonna pay for you to use Polygon, but they've already negotiated the rates. So Polygon is probably gonna be your first stop if you need a disaster recovery vendor in the state of Vermont and you work at a cultural heritage institution. So save the Polygon. They do have like a real deal 24 seven, like people are always sitting there. Uh, emergency line, put that number in your phone. And then after sort of the initial emergencies have passed, you might need a conservator. So this is a great, this is on AIC's website. They're gonna help you match to a conservator who does the specific kind of thing you have. And then we have a leaflet that helps you decide like how to pick a good conservator, depending on what your scenario is. Okay, before we talk about D-Plan, I just wanna take a quick break to see if there's any questions. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for guidance around uh, when you have a hybrid remote team um, mm -hmm. and they're maybe taking things home with them, what kind of guidance can you put in place around how those uh, documents are handled? What kind of documents are going home? I, we don't have anything too special, but they need to not get lost for organizational reasons. That's a great question. I have actually not considered that scenario, um, but let me see if there's any I have not researched those resources, but if there are any, I will add them to the resource guide and follow up. But I don't know of anything off the top of my head. I'm gonna have to think about that a little more. That's a really good question. I'm surprised it hasn't come up in this day of hybrid, because a lot of organizations at this point are doing a deal of hybrid work. Um, and I haven't thought about how people are handling that with their disaster plans. Any other questions? I might just jump in yeah. in response to that, that that's a really good thing to think about if you do have, if you are an organization that has people working remotely, and there was an organization that was impacted in the July 2024 floods where they had a staff member working from home and they lost both equipment um, in the flood but also really important files. So I think this falls more into continuity of operations plan than disaster plan. So anticipate, if we lost these files, how would we continue to, to operate and fulfill our mission. So I think you want to be mindful of, of, of copies, of backup, of making sure there's there's some sort of contingency plan in place for those particular records. I think I would just add to that, um, we try to make sure at our organization that everyone knows who's in the building on a given day and who isn't. And it's really easy to kind of slide into a situation where someone's supposed to be there and maybe they're not. So we've tried to make that a priority in our organization. It's peripheral, but it's related to what you're talking about. Yeah, when people don't have constant schedules, it's hard to know who's here on any given day. Um, and I, I will say, yeah, none of this really even gets into the, then the even more complicated nuances of like disaster planning in a digital context. Like, what if your entire hard drive is gone? Or there's like a whole other aspect of disaster planning related to digital world that we're not really diving into, but you do have to unfortunately plan for. Okay, with that, we're gonna do a quick run through of D-Plan. Um, for those of you who know the old D-Plan, um, this is different. Um, and, and I will kind of walk through for those of you who don't know what it might look like to implement something like this at your organization. So D-Plan Arts Ready is like an online emergency preparedness tool. So this is not your disaster plan. This is a tool that is going to help 
do some of the things that we just discussed in sort of a online friendly kind of guiding you through format. Um, originally, so I kind of mentioned that there was this older version of DPlan. That was something that NEDCC was maintaining. There was also um, another tool that Performing Arts Readiness was maintaining. And then we got a Mellon grant that, with Lyricist that sort of allowed us to put the two things together. So why it's called DPlan Arts Ready is that it is a disaster planning tool that's not just for cultural heritage organizations. It's also for performing arts organizations, um, all sorts of libraries kind of what's represented by these beautiful icons here. So it's it's general enough that almost anyone can use it. It's highly adaptable regardless of the size of your collection, how many buildings you have, like and almost anyone can use this. I'm not saying it's the perfect fit for every organization, um, but I think it's something that every organization, especially if you're struggling with disaster planning, should consider. Um, or maybe your disaster plan is going great. This is a great way to um, kind of continue down on that path. Um, so we're gonna kind of walk through what it looks like because I think sort of in it can be an ambiguous tool, but I wanna make it really specific what it looks like. So what's nice about the way it was designed is it was designed with that beautiful cycle that we looked at first thing today in mind. So all of these kind of modules within the tool map directly onto this cycle, right? So we're talking about risk assessments. We already talked a lot about that today. Your risk assessments, into your preparedness, and that's sort of where your critical stuff is. Your critical stuff is like your disaster planning documents. Um, and then reports and guides and resources, those are gonna be the documents that help you that you're gonna call upon when you're doing response and recovery. I also wanna kind of take a moment to say like who is doing this work. Um, there are three user types within DPlan. So the first one is your organization's admin. This is the this person can do absolutely anything within the tool. They can see everything, they can edit everything. They are going to be the person who's in charge of this tool. That's the person who you want to be your organization admin. It does not just have to be one person. You can make as many people admin as you want. Depends on your organization. Then you would have the manager level. They can view everything, but they do not have the ability to edit everything. Um, so that you'll see why that's nice, like so that they can't edit like key documents because you don't want everybody to have editing privileges. And then a contributor can only just see like what action items get assigned to them. And we'll talk more about what actions items look like, but that's what a contributor, they can't see like your priority list, things like that. So we're gonna go through all of these kind of section by section, starting with the risk assessment. I think this is actually the best feature of the tool. There, as I kind of already showed you, there's a million tools out there for risk assessment. I just like this one sort of allows you to do two things at once. Um, so it has 90 questions. I know that sounds like a lot, but honestly, you can really move through this and you can break it up and say like, I'm gonna do 10 questions today. I'm gonna do 10 questions tomorrow. This does not need to be a thing you sit down and do in one marathon. Actually, like, please don't try to do it all at once. So this is what that looks like. There's these nine critical areas, collections and assets, communication, community, facilities, finance, IT, people. You don't have to worry about like why they're broken up that way. You just click on each one, which is kind of a nice bar to measure your progress. And then you'll see there's all these questions. And the question will be something like, what is the one on screen? It says, uh, you have a crisis kit, disaster response kit, or cache of emergency supplies in your facility. So do you have those items? You would say, you're, you'd mark your readiness, like you're not ready, you don't have any of, you don't have a disaster kit on hand. Um, and then is how important is that? Well, I mean, disaster kit's nice to have, but it doesn't technically like fully impact, like it's not a huge high risk, so you might say serious or not serious. And then maybe you put a note here. Um, the note I wrote here says, we have kits, but they're ignored and that people have like pulled all the stuff out of them. Um, Based on how you rate that, so if you put it as both serious and not ready, which is what I did, see that little red dot in the corner? It's telling you, okay, that's something that you're gonna have to do something about. See how in this one we said not a risk, does not apply? We get a green check mark. We say, okay, don't even have to worry about that one, we're ready to go. And then my favorite part is that you can add an action item, which is that little button here. And I'll show you that on the next page. My one tip here though is hit save your answers. Because as you go through, if you then like leave the website for some reason, you will lose your progress. So just keep hitting save answers in the corner. So then if you get that green light and you're not ready, so serious. Wow, I didn't. 
Okay, I'm sorry. The action items is the next section, so forgive me. We'll, go, we'll get to that eventually. Um, so if you get, a, you get that little red mark, it's going to add that to your danger list, which will be kind of a correlated list of all of the things that got that red mark. So again, that you can filter out the stuff that you actually have areas where you need to do work. Um, and then you can actually take your whole risk assessment. This is something that you can export as a PDF. So that's nice, because again, you might want to hand this off to an executive director, to a board of trustees, to somebody else, so they can understand what those risks are and why you need to spend time and resources on mitigating them. Um, and then you can archive it, because guess what? Unfortunately, you will have to do it again someday. And so what's nice is you can archive it, you can do it again, and then you actually, what's really nice is you have two documents, and you can have proof of the progress you're making. You can say, okay, this is when I did the risk assessment. The first time I had 25 danger list items. Um, and now a year later, we do, it, we do this again and we audit ourselves and we say, oh wow, there's only three things and those were things that like, I'm still waiting on the funding for, for example. So you can really measure your progress by using this risk assessment tool, which I really like. Okay, so now we're talking about your action items. This is my favorite element, because as you're doing that risk assessment, the worst part, I think, is you're thinking, oh God, now I have to do something, now I have to do something. Well, as you go through the list, you can immediately hit add action item. So you're transforming these the danger list, which actually I think is quite a dramatic title. Um, anyways, it sort of gives me a little anxiety. Um, but then you can add your action item, and you can say what the task is, you can assign someone to be responsible for that task. You can assign a due date so that you have a way. It's a project management tool for responding to your disaster planning. Um, so it's a really easy way to sort of transform your risk assessment into your actual mitigation steps in a pretty kind of simple way. Um, okay, so then say you're out of the risk assessment. So you can see up here the different tabs. You have the risk assessment tab, which we already looked at. Then if you click into action items, you're gonna see that list that's being made as you go through your risk, ass risk assessment, seeing the various people they're assigned to. Um, if you are just like a manager, you're just gonna see the ones assigned to yourself. And then you have a spot, like a progress log, where you can say, okay, I went out and purchased disaster kit supplies, but I haven't put them together yet. Um, and then you can eventually mark them as complete. So it's a really nice place, again, to have, especially if you were the person in charge of managing disaster planning at your organization, you have a way to sort of keep track of things and make sure things are happening. Oh, and you can also export it as a CSV file. Critical stuff. So as I said earlier, you want a spot to have your disaster plan that's not just the physical copy, and maybe, I think a lot of us do now work at organizations with cloud services of some sort. Um, I don't think there's too many things as too many copies, especially like, I think we've all been in a, well, there was a situation right with that Microsoft cyber thing that had happened, like maybe you couldn't get on to your online OneDrive for whatever reason, who knows? This is another space that you can save and download documents. Um, and you can, there's all sorts of kinds of documents you can save and it'll kind of categorize them. You can save contact information into here. Um, you can upload parts of your plan into different pieces. And again, you can still control who can see these documents. Um, you can still keep this secure. It is, I don't know how to like talk about the encryption software of the website, but it is, you're not putting your most precious information onto a website that's gonna be like hacked. Um, it's got like web security on it. If you would like the actual details of that, I can point out to where they are on the website. I'm just not techie in that way. Hold on, I'm sorry, I lost my slides again. Okay, so this is your critical stuff. This is basically just a spot online that you can safely manage all your stuff and it's D-Plan was designed to be mobile user friendly. There's not an app, but it looks nice on your mobile phone. It's easy to navigate and get to your disaster plan in the event of an emergency. But again, dude, this is not your only spot. Please print it still too. Um, and then what's nice, although I'm not in that section yet, hold on, is then your reports. Now with the old D-Plan, they would like collate all of this information and print one big long report. The idea here is that, again, if you make all one big long report, you have people who need different parts. Not everyone needs the whole thing. And so with this one, under reports, you can say, okay, I just need the master contact list. And it's gonna pull all those contact information you put under critical stuff, and it's gonna make it into one nice list, and then you can export it as a CSV file and print it. Um, same thing with all of these. 
different plans. And then if you do need them all for your entire disaster plan, you can print all of them and staple them together or put them in a binder together. But this is a tool that's helping pull that information from critical stuff and put it in nice, neat, organized ways. And then we have our last section, which is guides and resources. This is a section we've already populated for you with lots of nice, handy disaster planning resources. Um, so this is a great place to come for information um, in nice kind of one spot so that you're not like, you're like, oh, I knew there was a thing on that one website that was really handy. Like we have kind of brought everything here together for you. Okay, that was like the world's quickest overview of DPlan. We're doing great on time. We're gonna have lots of time for questions, which is sort of my goal. Um, but that's just sort of big picture of what it does. If you were thinking you wanted to use it um, and you wanted more information about like how to set up a user account, things like that, we've already made a beautiful YouTube series that walks you through all of that. Um, also, oh, this is an old screenshot. There's one video that was everything I just did, but a little slower that I did for kind of more aimed towards libraries, but it's already recorded and up here for free. So if you wanna sort of see all those slides again, but me talking slower and more about libraries. Um, you can watch that version. It's, you know, again, it works for every organization. It was, again, geared towards libraries, but it applies to everyone. Um, so there's these great tutorials there. But you can also email us. So info at NEDCC. There's also a help at dplan.org if you need dplan specific help. Um, but info at NEDCC is going to get you to our preservation staff. And we're going to be happy to answer any kind of questions. We answer all types of preservation advice. Um, we get individuals who call us up with questions about their personal collections. And we will answer those questions to the best of our ability. Um, but if you have specifically more questions about DPlan, um, I'm really happy to answer those, give you more information about the tool. Again, it's not like the perfect resource for everyone, but it is something that um, we want to make sure organizations know is an option out there. Uh, and then stay in touch with us. There's some information here. And again, we'll be emailing all sorts of stuff um, with like the resource guide and the slides and all the things like that. Okay, are there any questions? Yes. What, what is the cost of uh, signing up for that? That is an amazing question and something that was supposed to be on my first slide. Um, it is a $60 a year subscription. Um, and all that is covering is essentially like our maintenance of the website. It's like, a, you know, we're not trying to, like, it's not a, a tool designed to make money. It's just covering the, the cost of hosting and keeping the website updated. Yes. So, so if I'm representing the historical society, but we have other organizations within our town, is there any way of linking those things so that if there's an emergency, we can all get into each other's or we'd have to be a, uh, like a manager of each other's deep plan? That's an interesting question. Um, you could do a couple things. I think the thing that I would recommend is just sharing account login information is the easiest. You could, depending on the kinds of organizations, like we've had organizations who are like a university that has two libraries on campus or a library and a museum on campus have one D plan account. And then in it, you can sort of separate out. You can do two a risk assessment and then archive it. And you say, okay, that's the risk assessment for this one building. We'll do another risk assessment for another building. Maybe you do a risk assessment for the organization as a whole. So depending, if things are similar enough, you could kind of group it under one account. It's probably going to be easier if things are different enough to have like two accounts, but then just share resource login. It's, it's not hard to just add another user so that they can log in and see that information. Um, and because you're all related, you, there shouldn't be a security issue with that necessarily. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I love the template for the pocket resource mm -hmm. guide. Is do you have templates you recommend, or is that in the plan itself for like what your disaster plan should look like all written out? I mean, unfortunately, it looks different for everybody. Um, the thing I think that will be most helpful is there is that worksheet um, that I linked to back on one of the disaster plan slides that we have on our website. That's like worksheet for building a disaster plan. I think that's as close as it gets for like a template because it's going to walk you through the sections and then they'll all be together. But it's a, there's not a good template for disaster plans because it's so organization specific. Yeah. I will say that FactArm has attempted to make some resources specific for Vermont organizations. So we have the pocket response plan that Jesse showed. We have a specific version for public libraries and another for municipalities. 
Um, and then we've also worked with historical societies to develop as basic a disaster plan template as we could. So again, specific for collecting institutions, but we, we actually trialed it out with the Norwich Historical Society, and it's about 17 pages. But it, the boilerplate has basic information in it, so you don't have to go scrounging around trying to find it. And then it's pretty clear where you would plug in your institution-specific information. So those resources are all linked from the VACDARN website under the Cultural Heritage Organization's Readiness tab. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Definitely check out the VACDARN website. And I also, I mean, and I tried in the resource guide to add some Vermont-specific things, but I think if you have questions about Vermont-specific things, like definitely go to resources in Vermont like Rachel, who is going to be able to point you towards those things. And then we also have stuff that's sort of general too. So there's a mix. Um, I'm putting out some things that I want people to take at the end. Um, this is a nice card that like has some basic stuff about deep plan because I know there's also people in the room who are like, wow, that actually sounds kind of cool, kind of fun, might want to use it, but you have to convince somebody. So you can go like have a physical thing to hand them. Um, but I also have like pencils and measuring tapes and this handy magnet, which has our emergency number on it. So I do not want to take this stuff back with me. There's also coasters, which kind of weird but fun. Um, so when we're done, please come up and take stuff. I do not want to take it back with me. Okay, any other questions? I would yeah. maybe just also make a pitch. If you are at a Vermont organization, specifically collecting, but if you're more performing arts or non, I don't have stuff, but I'm interested in the plan arts ready, let me know, because I'm curious about setting up a cohort for mutual support in actually signing up and getting through that filling up of uh, filling out of the template and getting involved so would love to to talk more with you about that That's me. all right patricia yay <laughs> yep okay any other questions about any doesn't have to be about deep plan it can also just be about disaster planning does everyone here have like an action item in their head that they're going to go do now that they have thought about disaster planning today does anyone want to share their action item with the group? One thing that they're going to do, it could be really small, like I'm going to Google D-Plan and see if I look what the website looks like. I'm going to download the FAIC app. That's a good one. You could do it right now while I'm talking and I wouldn't even be offended. You already did. There you go. There you go. The only thing I will say about it is if you're like me and then you go and you have a lot of apps on your phone and you want to search it to pull it up, you cannot search. I, I was I did this yesterday, and I to making sure I had it because I couldn't see it. You can't search F A I C. You have to search like E A R S or something. So keep that in mind. Do you, how how to find the app on your phone is good to know. Does anyone else have an action item they want to share? With the group. Okay, everyone should have an, at least one action item. So come on, something. Well, I mean, you you have yours, right? I put the numbers in my phone, but I have nice. a bunch of things to. Uh, You're gonna follow up on deep plan with Rachel. With the guy in charge. There you go. It's a good list. It's a good list. Anybody else? Okay, I know. It's it's the end of the day. We did great. I will be here uh, as I close up to answer any questions people don't want to ask in front of the group. Thank you all for the sitting through the technical troubles at the beginning and staying all the way here through the end of the day. I hope everyone has safe travels back home.